Thank you very much for, for having me. And um, I, I want to say a little bit about how we support survivors. And um, I do so from the perspective of the work for the Medai Trust, who were founded in about 2006, um, originally out of an initiative of, of the Catholic religious, and, and we've maintained those, those links ever since. And I want to um, kind of pick up the story from where Carol kind of left it really, which is what happens when somebody is identified what kind of support is then kind of made available to them? And um, the process of, of this kind of referral into the, into the national referral mechanism is called first responding. Um, and it's the process by which a, a potential victim is, is referred to the government to then make an initial assessment, a kind of way up based on the evidence which is presented about whether this person has on the face of things a plausible claim, but they may be a, a legitimate victim of modern slavery. And there are uh, various organizations which can make those referrals. So a list of them there, um, they include some charities like, like my own, but also various kind of government agencies and social workers that, that are in principle able to do this, that they do it, I think as Carol has intimated, with a kind of mixed success rate, depending on, uh, on who they are. But you go through that process and you get what's called a reasonable grounds decision. So they make that initial assessment and they say, well, you, you may be well be a, a legitimate victim. And at that point, various forms of support are meant to open up to you. And uh, that's where uh, an organization like mine comes in. Um, so we support uh, in, in our safe houses uh, about 600 people a year, 137 at any one time in 10 safe houses that we have at the moment, uh, four for men, four for women, and two family projects. And it's important to know, you know that safe house is there to provide um, a safe space, it's a shelter uh, away from their abuser and wherever it was that the initial exploitation took place. But it's also meant to be much more than that. Um, it's meant to provide wraparound support. Uh, we provide uh, a caseworker for each person that stays with us, and they are signposting people and providing support for healthcare, counselling, education, employment, help navigating the criminal justice system, whatever that person might need. Um, we, we provide these safe houses, uh, and uh, and they, you know, we, we, they have that wraparound support. They also do a lot of uh, of well-being support. That's been a major focus of us, and that includes providing trips, things which seem on the face of it to be kind of less important, trips to the zoo, crafts, sports, things like that. Actually, these two have a, a, a really kind of important therapeutic function about building up people's confidence, happiness, and well-being alongside the practical support that someone might need to recover. But they go through this, this process, and this, this is meant to take months, but you, have, you get your initial decision and then you're waiting while it's being assessed, while the Home Office looks into your case before you get what's called a conclusive grounds decision at, at the end of it. It's meant to take months. In practice, it takes uh, often years. And we, we have um, one lady who's been in service with us now. She's just mit, hit her sixth anniversary in the safe house, waiting for a final decision from the Home Office on her case. So, you know, these, these can take extraordinarily long periods of time, which can be very damaging to people's mental health. Um, but at the end of it, I think it's it, you know it's important to kind of emphasize this. They, they go through that process um, and other forms of support which may be available. They're not fixed at the end of it. No one it flips the switch and is suddenly recovered uh, at the end of that process. That's not how traumatized people work. And often we have someone in there with us for say some months or a few years, and then the Home Office will make a final decision and say, well now you need to move them on. You know, they now have the legal ability to work in this country or to receive benefits. They're no longer your responsibility. They need to be in the community. And what we find is that's all well and good to say, but it's not how it works in practice. So we also provide a, a moving on project, which is all about providing ongoing support to people who are living in the community, but actually they still need help with access to education or to health care um, or navigating the benefit system or migration advice or housing or all sorts of other things which people require. But all of that um, is challenging. There are lots of challenges in, in providing this ongoing support. And it, it's made difficult by all sorts of factors. It's made difficult by the people themselves. You know, any, anyone who's worked with, with traumatized people knows these are not always easy people. Um, that many of the men in particular 
uh, were, as part of their exploitation, paid in alcohol and drugs and have an alcohol and drug dependency. Many of them use alcohol and drugs as a way of dealing with their trauma after the event. Many of them suffer from severe mental health issues, which, which are ongoing. The climate towards those who are migrants is not favourable. You know, we saw the, the violence and the hostility um, over the past few months. About 50 to 60 percent of our service users at the moment are also in the asylum system. Uh, and we feel that concern about you know, what will happen if somebody were to target a safe house, would find the location, target it. That is, that is a worry for us. The policy environment is not always easy to, to work in in this space, but the biggest challenge of all um, is, is none of those things, really. It, it's what I would call a spiritual challenge. It's, it's the task of rebuilding people who've been often physically, emotionally and spiritually damaged by the experience of, of what they've been through. And I think I wanted to to pause on that point and look a little bit into kind of Catholic social teaching and, and in particular the idea of, of the betrayal of right relationships and of human dignity, and how difficult it is to restore and rebuild people in, in that situation and, and to look at a couple of the forms of, of modern slavery which, which Father Mark so helpfully picked out and the first of those is, that I want to talk about is around sexual exploitation and um, people who've been forced into prostitution or, or sexual abuse against their will and um, one of the most depressing features with this is the question about who does the trafficking and benefit it from this? Criminal gangs, yes, and you know we, we, there are the films and the dramas around that. But actually, what's much more depressing is that it's 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 actually much more often not criminal gangs. It's people's families uh, and intimate partners, boyfriends, husbands, who are the people who are doing the initial trafficking and the benefiting from people's exploitation in, in an overwhelming number of cases. Uh, there was a report which was done on Romanian women who'd been trafficked into the UK for sexual exploitation a couple of years ago. And it found that more than a fifth were recruited into this by a direct family member. And more than 64% had a life partner, uh, a boyfriend or a husband who was benefiting financially from the exploitation of someone who thought that they were their partner. One of the most depressingly common features uh, in our work is that we hear this story again and again and again of family members, boyfriends, husbands, who are the ones who, who've perpetuated this crime. Uh, and that, of course, is such a violation of Christian teaching on the family and, uh, and what close personal bonds are meant to provide. And one of the great challenges facing my organisation is how do you rebuild in people a, a sense of worthiness and a sense of trust in healthy, non-abusive relationships. And that's my kind of first major point on this. It, it's that for many victims, it's not just that something evil has been done to them, though it has. It's that in many cases, it's been perpetuated by what should have been the key, safest family relationship that they were meant to have. And we teach in Catholic social teaching that the, the family is the core kind of social unit and it's the center of social and spiritual development. And that makes it all the more spiritually and mentally destructive when that is what has been turned against you uh, as the nature of your, your exploitation. And the task of recovery goes so far beyond the practical reality of rescuing someone from a brothel or taking them away from a gang. It's that much longer and more difficult task of rebuilding the capacity to connect, to trust and to love. And then the second major area that I wanted to talk about in brief was, was around uh, labour exploitation. And at its most basic, of course, this is not remotely um, ethically complicated. It's forcing people to work without pay. But to tease out just one additional factor, it's that violation of dignity and of that Catholic social teaching principle of the dignity of work. So Pope Francis in Laudato Si' writes that work should be the setting for personal growth where aspects of life enter into play, creativity, planning for the future, developing our talents, living out our values, giving glory to God. Uh, and John Paul II in Laborum Exorcem's work is not only good in the sense that it's useful, it's also good as being something worthy, something that corresponds to man's dignity and increases it. But of course, what we see in labour exploitation is a flipping of that. This is labour at the service of capital. It's a deliberate violation and a stripping away 
not of development and agency and development, but of your ability to support yourself or have any choices of your own. Uh, Gustavo Gutierrez wrote that dignity necessitates that the poor be subjects of their own history, holding their own destiny in their hands. And that's such a crucial observation. The task of restoring people and rebuilding them can only really be done through providing them with the dignity in their own recovery. But that's incredibly difficult. People who've spent years having that stripped away from them, not only in their exploitation, but also in the care which is meant to be given to them, which is frequently re-traumatizing and difficult and keeps you in this kind of situation of being reliant on systems around you. And slavers, of course, know this, and they use this as a way of keeping people isolated and trapped and vulnerable and not able to go forwards for fear of being seen as a criminal or an illegal immigrant. And that's what I wanted to kind of conclude on was this task of support. It's rooted in a challenge which is spiritual and emotional, not simply practical. It's not just taking someone out, and giving them access to work. It's also that task of rebuilding them. And that is a community task. It's not just for charities. It's a whole community-wide effort which is required. And I'll finish on that point.